Everything in life happens somewhere, whether it's a happy memory, a sad memory, or the scene of a horrific crime. In this video, we will look at the houses where some of the most abhorrent crimes of the 20th century occurred, and learn about what happened to these homes after the killers were convicted. Twenty five Cromwell Street, Gloucester, England. An ordinary house in an ordinary street. Located just a few minutes walk from Gloucester city centre in England. The rows of terraced three story houses look like any other city centre dwellings. But what you are looking at is Cromwell Street, where at number twenty five, the house located next to a Seventh-day Adventist church was the scene of one of the most shocking and depraved crimes of the 20th century. Dubbed the House of Horrors, 25 Cromwell Street was the family house of serial killers Fred and Rose West, and is where the majority of the remains of the woman they murdered were found, including their 15-year-old daughter, Heather. Five young women were buried in the cellar and cemented in. Heather and two other women were buried in the garden under a patio, and the body of 19-year-old Linda Goff was found in an inspection pit beneath the garage, which had been converted into a bathroom. After the couple were arrested in 1994, a further three bodies were exhumed from various locations around Gloucestershire, including Fred's first wife, Renna, and his eight-year-old stepdaughter, Charmaine. It is believed they murdered other young women, whose bodies have never been located. Fred hung himself whilst on remand at HM Prison, Birmingham, on the 1st of January, 1995. At the time, he and Rose were jointly charged with nine murders, and he with three further murders. In November 1995, Rose was convicted of ten murders and sentenced to life in prison with a whole life order, meaning she will never be released. Rose is currently incarcerated in HM Prison Newhall, Flockton, West Yorkshire. The den of depravity on Cromwell Street was literally taken apart in the search for bodies and was later compulsory purchased by Gloucester City Council and demolished in 1996, partly because it was unsafe and partly because it had become a macabre dark tourist attraction. Even today, the street attracts people wanting to take sinister selfies next to the infamous Cromwell Street sign. There is a tree-lined walk through where 25 Cromwell Street used to stand, but no memorial to the victims that died at the spot. If you want a more in-depth look at the horrific crimes of Fred and Rose West, check out the documentary on the Murderous Minds channel. Fifty Irvin Drive, Margate. This is Fifty Irvin Drive in Margate, just a normal-looking family home with a variety of children's toys strewn around in the backyard. Through the summer months, the sound of children playing can be heard as their laughter echoes around the estate. However, this scene of happiness hides the horrors that once resided in that back garden. In 1991, Peter Tobin resided at 50 Irvin Drive. He only lived there for a couple of years before moving to Havant, Hampshire. But during his time there, he left a terrible secret buried in the back garden. On May the 18th, 1994, Tobin received a 14-year prison sentence for sexually assaulting two 14-year-old girls. He served just 10 years and was released in 2004. After his release, 
he started using the name Pat McLaughlin, and in breach of his release terms, he moved to Glasgow where he got a job as a church handyman at St. Patrick's Church in Anderston. On September the 24th of that year, 23-year-old Polish student Angelica Kluck went missing. After a frantic search, she was eventually found dead in an underground chamber beneath the floorboards of St. Patrick's Church. Pat McLaughlin was immediately a suspect, and when his real identity was realised, he was arrested. At the trial, he was convicted of murdering Cluck and was sentenced to life imprisonment. The judge described Tobin as an evil man. Following his conviction, the police looked into the disappearances of other women who were linked to Tobin, and Operation Anagram was launched. The operation led them to Tobin's former home at 50 Irvine Drive. Excavation of the back garden revealed the bodies of Vicky Hamilton and Dinah McNichol, who had both been missing since 1991. Tobin was hauled back to court and convicted of both their murders and given a whole life order. Tobin is suspected of killing several other women and he allegedly told a prison psychiatrist he murdered 48 people. However, he took his true murder total to the grave when he died at Edinburgh Royal Infirmary on October the 8th, 2022, at the age of 76. After no one claimed his body, he was cremated and his ashes were scattered at sea. The family living at 50 Irvine Drive at the time the bodies were uncovered were unable to live with the horrors of what had been found and immediately left. Today, the house is occupied by a family who have lived there happily for a number of years and have done their best to erase its grisly past. Sixteen Wardlebrook Avenue, Manchester, England. By June 1963, Ian Brady and Myra Hindley had already killed three children: 16-year-old Pauline Reed, 12-year-old John Kilbride, and Keith Bennett, also aged 12. All three were buried on Saddleworth Moor. In 1964. Hindley, her grandmother and Brady were rehoused as part of the post-war slum clearances in Manchester and relocated to 16 Wardlebrook Avenue in the new overspill estate of Hattersley near the Cheshire town of Hyde in the UK. The house was a standard new council house at the time and Myra was excited to decorate it when they first moved in. However, what was to come was the stuff of nightmares. In the same year they moved in, Brady and Hindley visited a funfair in Ancoats on the 26th of December and noticed that 10-year-old Leslie Ann Downey appeared to be alone. They lured her to their car by asking her to help with some shopping bags. Then they abducted her and took her to Wardlebrook Avenue. There, they subjected the little girl to appalling abuse as she cried for her mother. In a sickening twist, they also recorded the attack. After killing the poor Leslie, they drove her body to Saddleworth Moor and buried her in a shallow grave. Less than a year later, on October the 6th, 1965, they abducted 17-year-old Edward Evans and again took him to Wardlebrook Avenue. At some point, Hindley's brother-in-law, David Smith, joined them. David later heard horrific screams, and when he went to investigate, he witnessed Brady in the living room hitting Evans across the head with a hatchet before he throttled him to death with a length of electrical cord. Brady then asked Smith to move the body to the car, but it was too heavy, 
so they wrapped it in plastic sheeting and put it in the spare bedroom with the intention of disposing it later. Racked with guilt over what he witnessed, Smith later alerted the police. Brady was arrested and later Hindley, both charged and convicted with the murder of Kilbride, Downey and Evans. Both received life sentences under a whole life tariff. The investigation into their crimes was reopened in 1985 after Brady confessed to the murders of Pauline Reed and Keith Bennett. Hindley also confessed to all of the murders in 1987. Years after the crimes, the bodies of Pauline Reed, Leslie Ann Downey and John Kilbride were recovered from Saddleworth Moor. However, despite extensive searches, the body of Keith Bennett has never been recovered. Hindley spent the rest of her life in prison despite repeated appeals for her release and died in 2002 in West Suffolk Hospital, aged 60, after serving 36 years. Brady, who was diagnosed as a psychopath in 1985, died in 2017 at Ashworth Hospital, aged 79, having served 51 years. The world was finally rid of two sadistic killers of the utmost depravity. After the sentencing, Manchester City Council were unable to find any tenants willing to live in 16 Wardlebrook Avenue. The property was regularly vandalised with messages written on the dusty windows. The council decided that it would be best to demolish it. The location where the house once stood is now the garden of house number 14. To this day, people still visit to look at the empty plot where the murder house used to stand. For a more in-depth look at this case, check out our Murderous Minds channel. Four Heartland House, Camden. In January 2002, Police were called to Heartland House, a block of flats in Camden, London. One of the residents had complained that someone had vandalised her front door and she believed it was her neighbour, Anthony Hardy, who lived in flat number four. After police gained access to Hardy's flat, they found the naked dead body of a woman lying on a bed with cuts and bruises to her head. She was later identified as 38-year-old sex worker Sally White. Forensic pathologist Freddie Patel subsequently concluded that White had died of a heart attack. This finding was later disputed and Patel has since been struck off. No further action concerning the death of Sally was taken against Hardy, but he was charged with criminal damage. He claimed he had no knowledge of how White came to be in his flat due to his drinking problem. Hardy was detained under the Mental Health Act until November 2002, when he returned to his flat in Camden. Shortly after his release, a homeless person scavenging in rubbish bins found the dismembered body parts of two women, wrapped in black plastic bin liners. They were later identified as 29-year-old Elizabeth Vallard and 34-year-old Bridget McLennan. The investigation led to the arrest of Hardy a week later and a forensic search of his flat found evidence indicating the two women had been killed and dismembered there. Under interrogation, Hardy answered no comment to every question put to him by police but was eventually charged with the murders of McLennan, Vallad, and Sally White. At his trial in November 2003, Hardy unexpectedly changed his plea to guilty to all three counts of murder and was sentenced to life imprisonment. In 2010, 
Hardy was diagnosed with a personality disorder and the High Court ordered he should never be released. Hardy died of pneumonia at HM Prison Frankland, County Durham on the 25th of November 2020, aged 69. It is believed Hardy was responsible for the murders of two sex workers whose dismembered bodies were found in the River Thames and at least five other unsolved murders of young women. Despite protests from residents at Heartland House, number four was refurbished and released, possibly to an unsuspecting tenant unaware of the home's grisly past. Today, the block of flats on Royal College Street is a peaceful place filled with young families. Number four is occupied, and for those that are aware, it must be a dark reminder of some of the most horrific murders ever seen in North London, perpetrated by a man dubbed the Camden Ripper. Summerdale Avenue in Norwood Park Township. 8,215 W. Summerdale Ave in Norwood Township is a smart three-bed, two-bathroom home in Chicago, Illinois. It was built in 1996 and over the years has changed hands several times, and for good reason. This ordinary looking house in a nice neighborhood was built on the site where notorious killer John Wayne Gacy's house once stood. Between 1972 and 1978, Gacy raped, tortured, and murdered at least 33 young men and boys in Norwood Park Township and committed all of his known murders inside his ranch style house on 8213 W. Summerdale Ave. Known as the Killer Clown due to his public performances as a clown prior to the discovery of his crimes. Gacy lured his victims to his home and duped them into wearing handcuffs on the pretext of demonstrating a magic trick. Once incapacitated, Gacy tortured his victims before killing them either by asphyxiation or strangulation with a grat. 26 of his victims were buried in the crawl space of his home, and three were buried elsewhere on his property. Four were discarded in the nearby Des Plaines River. His conviction for 33 murders is one of the highest death counts caused by a single individual in the United States legal history. Gacy was sentenced to death on March 13, 1980, and was executed by lethal injection at Statesville Correctional Center on May 10, 1994. His last words were reportedly, Kiss my ass. In 1979, the ranch home was demolished, and in 1986, the three-bedroom brick home was built on the land. The stigma attached to the location of the property makes it hard to sell, and the thought of living on the site of so many grisly murders is not surprisingly very off-putting. The home is the exact same location as Gacy's house, but has a different address, switching the numbers from 8,213 to 8,215. Would you live there?